Sorry, Nigel. No, I was, I was just going to say um, we had our Scottish um, dialect uh, Zoom uh, on, on Monday again, but there was an interesting lady came on from Scottish Random History. I don't know if you know it's Scottish. Her name is Jenny, and she's trying to dig up a lot of the original um, references from old documents and newspapers and all this kind of stuff to try to look at the, the root of where Scottish history was was written and not just, you know, not just as it was written by the the winners or the, the you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Gus, I'll be asking you to speak shortly in a few minutes. We're just giving folks a few minutes to, to join in before we start. Right, you are, Connie. Thank you. People are going to the microwaves and getting that mug of coffee, I think. They'll be that here. Might be <laughs> And I see John Bowman. And under tonics, uh, caramel wafer, you know? <laughs> That's very important. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> Okay, well, yeah, you know, it's two minutes after 10. So I think I'll go ahead and get started and, and say hello to everyone this morning. Um, I'm Connie Nestor, and I've had the pleasure of chairing the Scottish American History Forum almost 12 years now, I believe. And I would like to welcome all of you to the forum this morning. As I believe most of you know, the Scottish American History Forum is part of the Arts and Cultural Division of Chicago Scots, formerly the Illinois St. Andrews Society, which founded the oldest 501c3 charity in the state of Illinois way back in 1845, later named Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care. It's located in North Riverside, Illinois. And Chicago Scots is dedicated to nurturing Scottish identity through service, fellowship, and celebration of Scottish culture, in addition to support of the Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care Campus. And so for additional information, we hope you'll all uh, consult our website, which is www.chicagoscots.org which will tell you all about the charity and our upcoming events. And I'll ask you please to give generously to our Caledonia Senior Care Charity. It's really one of a kind mission that all Scots can be proud of. So before we begin our presentation today with question and answer period afterwards with our esteemed speakers, Professors Stephen Bowman and George Toft, we are delighted to have Gus Noble with us. Gus is president of Caledonia and Chicago Scots. And, and Gus is here to greet and welcome everyone. Gus, um, in addition, maybe you'll tell us a little bit about the upcoming St. Andrew Day Gala on December 2nd, if you will. I will, thank you, Connie. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. Um, I just want to say, I think that's Harris McKee I see there. Harris, hello, how are you? Harris is a friend of mine that lives at the Admiral at the Lake, where yes. I'm proud to serve on the board. Um, I, uh, I'm grateful to you for allowing me a few minutes to say hello to everyone and, and to thank uh, everyone for joining us this morning. And thank you in particular, Connie, for your leadership. Last year, around this time, I made an announcement that uh, our... Um, forthcoming St Andrew's Day dinner would feature, uh, which always features three awards, the, the awards to recognise um, excellence and contributions to the greater good and accomplishment is given to our distinguished citizen, and two other awards, the Kinsman of the Year and the Kinswoman of the Year awards were given to those who exemplify um, extraordinary commitment through volunteerism, and that person, the Kinswoman last year, was Connie Nestor. 
I'm uh, so proud that, that uh, you uh, did us the the uh, great honour of uh, uh, accepting the award. And in your stead this year will be another person who's worked tirelessly for the uh, the uh, organisation's historical uh, uh, side, and that is Beth Schulmeister. Who oh, oh is, great. Fabulous. Uh, runs our Scottish Genealogy Society. The Kins Man of the Year Award is somebody who has really become part of our, our, our culture in many different ways. Um, first, he, he, he became a, a regular visitor to the home when his mother lived there. Then he became, after her passing, uh, a regular volunteer and has done so for a number of years now, even through COVID, uh, COVID lockdown. And that's Curtis Linder, who most recently uh, chaired our, our Kilted Classic Golf Outing, and then accepting our Distinguished Citizen Award uh, are um, a generation, three generations in fact, of one family. Uh, we have Distinguished Citizens this year, and on behalf of his grandfather, who served on our board, his father, who served on our board, is Jim Buick, who also serves on our board. So not only do they represent three generations of leadership for the company that they they uh, run Roscoe Company, but they represent three generations of leadership on our Scottish society. And that speaks to uh, their family's commitment to pay it forward, to to really think of the generations to come, which is really what we are all uh, here for. You know, it's, a, it's a, a wonderful thing that we enjoy a moment together, but really what this organisation represents is this transmission of the, the uh, assurance of what it means to be Scottish from one generation to the next. Uh, and, and surely these these history uh, forum meetings that you're uh, organising, Connie, are an important part of how we do that today. Um, I, I want to just take another brief look over our shoulders and, and remember somebody that was dear to us all. Uh, and in fact, I, I doubt that we would be here together today were it not for this man, and he, uh, he you may have um, spoken reverently about him at our last meeting, um, but if if you would uh, permit me to, I'd just like to to thank uh, my predecessor, Connie, your predecessor as leader of the, the History Forum, Wayne Rethford, who, who passed away uh, at the Scottish Home. Um, very fittingly, you know, in a building that he himself uh, led the campaign to build, um, he he passed away um, had being cared for by a member of staff that he himself had hired 20 years ago. And it's, uh, it's a, a wonderful honour that we were able to care for him in his last moments. Uh, he was the president of Chicago Scots, Illinois St Andrews Society for 18 years, was part of the greatest generation became a friend to us all and and this Scotsman you know really relied heavily on Wayne for moments where uh, I I didn't know what to do and I, I struggled with uh, how to run an organization with big personalities on the board and the challenges of of running a, a, a very regulated healthcare facility and of course Scots always get along wherever we go there were no fights at all between uh, uh, members of the society. And Wayne used to just chuckle and put his hand on my shoulder and, and give me this calming hand of assurance. And though he never actually gave me advice, I always knew what to do after having spoken with Wayne. And so I just wanted to, to uh, for the record, say how much uh, I appreciate him and I'm, I'm sure I represent our, our all gra the gratitude and, and appreciation that we all feel for Wayne. So th thank you for allowing me that moment this morning, Connie. Oh, Gus, thank you. Thank you for, for those inspirational words. And Wayne was a great man and will be missed. And and thank you for your leadership, Gus. When, Gus, one thing on a happier note that you didn't mention that I was thinking you might is that Gus is an alumni from the University of Stirling. I forgot to mention that. Thank you, Connie. <laughs> that was the thing I really wanted to mention. Um, uh, I'm very proud to have studied and graduated from Sterling at uh, um, uh, a point in my life where I, I thought, you know, where, where am I headed here? And, and I, I really enjoyed and appreciated my time at Sterling too from, from 87 to 91. 
I, uh, I started and matriculated and registered to do accountancy and quickly discovered that I was neither good at it nor interested in it and, and quickly migrated through the, the departments to anthropology, which was really my, my uh, interest and, and passion. And when the music stopped after four years, I seemed to have a, a, a joint honours degree in um, uh, human resource management and sociology. And when I graduated, I got a letter from the principal at the university that said, congratulations, Mr. Noble, you have pursued the most deviant degree program I have ever seen. So uh, I, I, I squeaked through and looked back on my days at Stirling with great fondness. Uh, and in fact, I was just there uh, last year, my, my nephew studies at Stirling, and I got to go and visit some of my old lecture halls and walk the the hallways that I'd enjoyed so much. And many of our scholars through the Harper Brown Scholarship Programme study at Stirling also. And I know you do, Connie. So we have the Chicago Scots and Stirling University have a, a terrific bond. Here, here. And Gus, thank you. Thank you for your inspirational dialogue with us this morning. And the St. Andrew's Day Gala sounds very exciting on December 2nd. So please come up and join us for that in Chicago. It promises to be a whole lot of fun and, and uh, very, very gratifying. So um, just one more announcement, if you'll indulge me before we uh, move on. Just a reminder that next month on November 11th, Dr. Marjorie Harper, professor and chair in history, School of Divinity and uh, history, sorry, she's professor and chair of history within the School of Divinity, History and Philosophy at King's College in the University of Aberdeen. And Marjorie is going to be with us to discuss religion in Scotland, medieval times to the present. And this discussion on religion was requested by members of the group. So it promises to be a fascinating topic and I really hope you'll all make time to join in for this discussion with Marjorie. And so now, uh, gentlemen, it's time to move forward with our presentation today. We are just so very pleased to have with us live from Stirling, Scotland, Dr. Stephen Bowman and Dr. George Toth, lecturers in history at the University of Stirling who are going to discuss with us the memory of John Paul Jones in Scottish American relations between the 1890s and the 1970s. So professors, we very much appreciate you being with us today. And I believe Jack and I are ready to turn the program over to you now, please. Well, thank you for that kind welcome. Uh, and Gus, we're in the Pathbook Lecture Theatre, if you remember your way around campus. We've chosen to try and do it in the Lecture Theatre today, so you'll remember that from your time here at Stirling. Um, I'll just try and share my screen, so let me know if that does or doesn't work. We do have a PowerPoint presentation. Has that worked okay? We're not seeing the presentation quite yet, or at least I'm not, Stephen. And now we can see it beautifully. Thank you. Perfect. Good. 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 Okay. Thank you. I'll I'll get started. Um, okay. So the main details of John Paul Jones's life and times are fairly well established, but as we'll show today, much about him remains shrouded in myth. Described as the man who gave the U.S. Navy its earliest traditions of heroism and victory, Jones was born in 1747 in Arbigland in Galloway in Southwest Scotland um, and was named uh, at birth John Paul. He was an accomplished sailor, uh, sailing slave ships to the Caribbean, eventually adding the name Jones and settling in Virginia following his killing of a mutineer in strange circumstances. From about 1774, John Paul Jones lived in his late brother's house in Fredericksburg, Virginia, before joining the Continental Navy at the beginning of the Wars of Independence. 
He won impressive victories against the British, most notably at the Battle of Flamborough Head in 1779, where he captured the HMS Serapis, despite the loss of his own ship, the Bonhomme Richard. After US independence, Jones returned to Europe, serving in the Navy of the Russian Empress Catherine II, and later being accused, probably falsely, of raping a young girl, and then he died in France in 1792. So John Paul Jones's reputation has never been straightforward. For much of the 19th century, he was regarded by the British as a, a treacherous pirate, but even in the US, his legacy has not been uncomplicated. Jones had left America in 1783 and lived most of the rest of his life in Europe. Uh, and after he died, his body lay in a largely forgotten grave in Paris until it was discovered by the US ambassador to France, Horace Porter, in 1905. Jones's body was returned to the US with great ceremony the following year with President Theodore Roosevelt using the occasion to encourage support for naval expansion. But even then, though, uh, Jones was left beneath uh, a stairwell in the US Naval Academy's uh, Bancroft Hall in Annapolis and was disparagingly labelled by the cadets as, quote, the most buried man in the world. His body was finally placed in the crypt beneath the Academy's chapel in 1913. Um, so the, the slide I've put on here just is a selection of quotations describing uh, Jones. We've taken these from various newspapers, um, other documents, other uh, pamphlets to do with Jones. You can see the, the variety of views that this man has generated. He's quarrelsome, mean and selfish, a traitor to his country. Um, the quotation at the end there about... Um, commenting on him being a soldier of fortune, of being a mercenary, comes from a New York University who removed him from their Hall of Fame in 1915 because they thought he was just not appropriate as an American hero. Be that as it may, he does have a very impressive uh, crypt sarcophagus uh, beneath the, the chapel at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, and I was there earlier this year and took these photographs. Um, Clearly, the, the look of the crypt is perhaps a reminder of the contested and constructed nature of Jones's reputation. Clearly, we need reminded of how important he might have been. And although his reputation or his, his uh, fame is as the so-called father, the founder of the US Navy, this claim itself um, appears to have been largely fabricated uh, by a man called Augustus uh, Buell uh, in a book from 1900, in which he, he literally described Jones as the founder and not simply the father and spirit of the United States Navy. He, he, kind of, he wasn't. Um, now, there's other there's reasons for that. I won't go into that because, as we've said, our focus today is on his, his uh, legacy, his memory, how he's been commemorated, but there's a, a literature you can call upon if you are keen to know about who so founded the, the Navy. Other examples include John Barry, an Irish-born revolutionary who is favoured especially, uh, has been favoured especially by Irish diaspora in the US in the 20th century. So George and I are focusing on these sorts of questions about how Jones has been remembered through time. And today we want to guide you through some of the peaks and the troughs in this fighting Scotch Americans reputation in the 20th century. And our contention is, is there's been several different waves of interest in Jones, and a nautical metaphor, of course, both in Scotland and in the US, and indeed in different parts of Scotland and in the US. I'll speak mostly about the first half of the 20th century, and George will pick up the second half of the talk and focus on the second half of the period. So to be clear, neither George nor I are scholars of the revolution. We are focusing on um, how Jones has been used, remembered, commemorated on both sides of the Atlantic uh, in the, the 20th century. All right. Now, clearly, um, 
American attitudes to Jones were altogether more mixed and ambivalent than suggested by the pomp and ceremony of the Horace Porter find in 1905. And given that levels of commitment to the commemoration of Jones in the US have fluctuated quite dramatically, I think it's important to consider whether forces other than time uh, have shaped his memory, especially at the beginning of the 20th century. My argument is that the cultural resonance of Jones could depend not only and not even mostly on changing times, but also on place. And I want to introduce a notion uh, that Jones is not simply an international or transnational historical figure, uh, but a translocal one. And that's a phrase I've discussed with Connie uh, just recently, so it may be interesting to you, Connie, to, to, to hear more about this. This means that I think his history and the history of his reputation is about the exchange and construction of historical and cultural discourses and memories between interconnected local, that is to say, subnational places. In other words, how different peoples and countries understand each other is shaped at the local level and not the national one. And I'll explain why I think this is especially important in the case of, of Jones. So the place with which Jones is most associated in the US is Fredericksburg in Virginia. Um, and the slide shows uh, his, his house uh, in Fredericksburg. It's, just, it's so very close to the train station. I took that photo myself from the, from the train uh, going down to Richmond in February. Now, in the face of it, there's no surprise that this was the American town that made the most effort to claim Jones uh, and claim his memory in later years. But I think I'll show that more deep-rooted historical forces than just local pride were at play. And specifically, I think that his memory in the early 20th century US was seen by some in the context of the cultural and political distinctiveness of the Southern states. The notion of Virginia as the Old Dominion, colonized by 17th century English cavaliers, was especially important to this framing. And a local history by a man called John T. Gulrick, and I'll mention him a good few times over the course of my presentation, John T. Gulrick, and published in 1935, explained that, quote, the story of Fredericksburg is that of the Cavalier Settlement, which was led by the people who, uh, the best blood of the strains that made England. Now, Gulrick listed many of the prominent historical figures from the area, including George Washington, of course, and James Madison, and Confederate leaders uh, Robert E. Lee and Sidney Smith Lee. But importantly, the book also emphasized that Fredericksburg was, quote, the only home in America of John Paul Jones. So Gulrick's description um, of the Cavalier country is also an exceptional, but his mention of Jones in this context was revealing and is important. And in his case, was based on his family's, including his father and mother's, long-standing interest in the history of Jones and their entanglement with the culture of the American South. In fact, Gulrick's own parents were described in 1912 as having, quote, done more than anybody else to keep the history of John Paul Jones in the US, including by proving beyond doubt that he was a citizen of Virginia and a resident of Fredericksburg. And in fact, Gilrick's father, John, who was also called John, uh, John T, um, even claimed to have been responsible for generating the public interest in Jones that encouraged Hor Horace Porter's searches in Paris in the first place. Now, this is the important point. The people who had done more than anybody else to protect Jonesy's memory in the US happened to be ex-Confederates. Gilrick Sr. was a judge in Fredericksburg who, as a young man in the Civil War, fought for the Confederacy and was present at Robert Lee's surrender to the Union forces in 1865. Gilrick was described in the early 20th century as uh, remaining connected prominently with Confederate affairs. And in his own book from 1922, a book called Historic Fredericksburg, emphasized how the town had given, quote, its heart to the Confederacy and, quote, all its soul and all it possessed to the South. 
So the cultural memory of John Paul Jones, a man of the South who Gulrick Sr. described as having enjoyed unparalleled honour before suffering the greatest ignominy of dying forgotten in France, was in part mediated by notions about the apparent virtuousness of the defeated Confederacy's war aims. He was a lost 18th century American hero for a 19th century lost cause. And the point is, it's no accident that much of the local activity around the commemoration of Jones in the South took place amidst an increase in the numbers of Confederate statues being built across the US, which peaked in uh, the Civil War's anniversary year of 1911. So the, the language that Gulick was using about uh, Jones dying, you know, forgotten, but the nobleness of his cause, this, this is all stuff that I think adds uh, credence to that notion there's a connection there with uh, lost cause rhetoric. Now we'll explore that in a bit more uh, detail. Because there were specific reasons why John Paul Jones was especially usable in this context at this time and place. Lost cause rhetoric was as much, if not more, about constructing a Southern identity within the Union as it was about any continued appetite for secession. In the historian David Blight's words, lost cause was a means, quote, through which white Southerners could solidify both their Southern pride and their Americanness. This was also the period in which Virginia-born Woodrow Wilson, who had previously distanced himself from his Southern roots, felt more able to identify both as a Southerner and as an American. Wilson's great biographer, Arthur Link, even argued that the future president came to realize that, quote, that in a country as large as the US, one can love his country only by first loving the region and people with whom he identifies historically and emotionally. That's interesting wording, I think, for ideas of the translocal. And this was reflected in Wilson's historical writing and had its echo in the Southern interest in Jones at the beginning of the 20th century. Jones was a local and regional figure who, as a hero of the revolution, could be reconciled to a larger sense of Americanness. In this way, the South was presented as the true heir of the American revolutionary tradition. And Jones wasn't the only person who, to be used in this way um, and to have been incorporated into the lost cause narrative. Some people even likened George Washington to Jefferson Davis, describing Washington as the first rebel president. Indeed, the converse side of this process resulted in Robert Lee being refashioned into a nationally acceptable figure, especially after the erection of a statue in Richmond in 1890. But the tragic, the less nationally iconic, but also less controversial figure of Jones slotted much more easily into a narrative about Southern distinctiveness and American patriotism. Now the Southern construction of Jones's memory came from the ways in which his life story was understood with reference to those aspects of Virginian identity rooted in the state's colonial and Atlantic world history. John Gilrick Sr., little friend, described Jones as an uncouth lad from rural Scotland who became a sea fighter whose temerity outranks all and crucially emphasised how Jones's time in Fredericksburg had turned him into a gentleman. He writes, it is sure that the chivalry, the grace and courtliness which admitted him in later years to almost every court in Europe was absorbed from the gentry in Virginia. He didn't learn it on merchantmen or in his humble Scotch home. Gilrick Jones was, quote, a dandy who walked the streets of Fredericksburg in rich dress alongside Thomas Jefferson, the Marquis de Lafayette, and his friend uh, and fellow Scottish-American uh, uh, revolutionary leader, Hugh Mercer. According to Gilrick, though Fredericksburg was both a civilizing influence on Jones and a place that humble Scots bound to their liking because it makes them feel a sort of kinship with the country of hell shadows and strange romance. These descriptions of Scotland and Virginia 
or this part of Virginia are reflective of particular cultural narratives about both locations and about Jones. They demonstrate the complicated nature of self-perceptions in locations that have grappled with overlapping identities, Scottish, Virginian, Celtic, Scotch-Irish, English, British, American. And as a result, interpretations of Jones in part relied on views about the ways in which 18th century British settlers in the Americas shaped culture, society, and political traditions in what became the US. And so by the early 20th century, Jones had become attractive to an Anglophile Southern constituency to whom uh, Galavidian Scott was English and Virginian enough. Now, my idea of the trans-local obviously means having to think about things on the other side of the Atlantic too. And if Jones was a hero in the American South, then he was also especially well known in his native Southwest Scotland. And there's a nice kind of synergy between that two Souths um, sharing this figure. Importantly, he, Jones acted as a sort of touchstone, a point of contact between these two places in the first half of the 20th century. And I'll give some examples of this. And the early 1930s provide some of the best examples of this. For instance, US ambassador to the UK, Charles Dawes, visited Kirkudbury, which is along the coast from where uh, Jones was born, in August 1931, ostensibly to open a new school gymnasium gifted by Thomas Cochran, a Minnesota-born, New York-based JP Morgan banker with ancestral connections to Southwest Scotland. Now this, this, the foundation stone for the gymnasium had been laid in a ceremony in November the previous year, at which Cochrane's Scottish-based representative, a man called uh, T.J. Carlyle Gifford, said that he hoped, quote, the donation would be the means of turning an occasional thought to the United States, their history and their heroes. Now, demonstrating a transatlantic dimension or a translocal dimension to the discourses propping up American sectional reconciliation, Gifford singled out two figures in addition to John Paul Jones in particular, and they were Abraham Lincoln and Robert Lee. Now, interesting, I think. So the following year, uh, Charles Dawes, he, he came in to, to open the gymnasium in August 1931 in what was a major civic occasion covered by the BBC and uh, alongside various other very important politicians in Scotland and the UK. Um, prominent Americans, including John Paul Jones fan, and maybe we'll speak more about this uh, later, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who was then governor of New York, sent telegrams and letters to Kakubi to mark the event. In the ceremony, Dawes gifted an American flag to the school that was donated by the Naval History Society of America, whose president, James Barnes, was present and described Jones as a brave and gallant Scotsman who became an American hero, who first saw the light of day in Kirkupisher. Now, the local connections, though, remained crucial, with Barnes saying that, quote, it was an honour that an American flag should be accepted by a Scottish school as a token of America's admiration, excuse me, and a further honour that it should rest in Kirkupisher, John Paul Jones' birthplace, and be accepted by a school that was in existence in his boyhood. Like Likewise, uh, the Kakudbury provost uh, later said that Jones was a local product who achieved fame by becoming the father of the American Navy. So Jones was now a Scottish-American hero who provided a local frame of reference to understand Galloway's, Southwest Scotland, and Scotland's shared place in wider international developments, including UK-US relations. I'm not going to too much here, but we can maybe talk about that later. So my, my key point to make, I think, is that the memorialization of Jones, the commemoration of Jones, was largely occurring below the level of high politics and official diplomacy. The Scottish-American Jones was constructed translocally with reference uh, to uh, 
Kirkibrisher in Eastern Galloway, and Fredericksburg in Virginia. The J.P. Morgan banker, who you mentioned, Thomas Corkin, was actually at the centre of this. Only the year before he'd given money for the school gymnasium in Kirkcubri, Scotland had given money to the cost of a new gravestone to Jones's brother, William Paul, in the cemetery in, in Fredericksburg. This was erected on the anniversary of the Battle of Flamber, Flamber Ahead and in cooperation with the Naval History Society and was brought about in part with the cooperation and work of the Gulick family, who I've mentioned in great detail already. And the Gulicks were responsible for relaying this information back to the Scottish press uh, in southwest Scotland. Okay, so I'll leave it there and pass over to George to explore other uh, translocal activities around Jones and his native Scotland in the later, later period. All right, so <clears throat> you're experiencing a change of dialect and a change of pace as I take over. Um, good, so... So wartime uses of Jones's memory. The memory diplomacy with um, uh, Paul Jones resumed even before the Second World War ended. So we're talking about in the middle of the Second World War. As several British newspapers reported on May the 1st, 1943, on behalf of the women of Yorkshire, Miss Evelyn Cardwell presented to Admiral Harold Stark, commander of the United States <clears throat> Navy in Europe, a replica of the US flag that Jones's ship flew back in 1779 at the Battle of Flamborough Head. In, in attendance were Sir Dudley Pound of the, U, uh, the, the UK's first sea lord and York's Lord Mayor Edward Lacey. The, um, the, the London ceremony was also broadcast by the BBC Overseas Service as well as the US National Broadcasting Corporation. The ceremony speeches predictably framed the past conflict in terms of the present unity against the two countries' evil foes. York's Lord Mayor Lacey said, and I quote, few even of the founders of the Great Republic of America would have dreamed on that September day in 1779 when the HMS Serapis and the Bonham Vichar were locked in deadly combat of Flamborough, that the day would come when the United States and the British Commonwealth would be joined together in a life and death struggle in the defense of our common heritage of liberty and our democratic principles against the Nazi and, Jap and Japanese tyranny. Mrs. Cardwell presented the replica flag as, in my view, a feminized metaphor for healing past wounds and binding the two nations together. Quote, Paul Jones allowed the original flag to go down as a winding sheet for his brave comrades whose bodies sank with the ship. May this replica be a winding sheet for our old misunderstandings between the two nations. In this, the quote, women of York, Yorkshire dutifully symbolically perform their usual gender roles in a British war, tending to the wounded and dying and healing those who they can. From the other side of the, uh, the oceanic national and gender divide, Admiral Stark praised this, quote, expression of the healing of past wounds, faith in the present, and hope for the future. Although the main players knew that the Bonhomme Richard actually sank in the battle, the flag was regarded as, a meaningful, as meaningful enough that it was given to be displayed at the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis, also the gravesite of Jones. Admiral Stark promised uh, that, the, that in, in Annapolis, the flag would remain, uh, remind the generations of midshipmen of the unity of the two nations. U.S. Ambassador to Britain, John Wynant, framed the gesture in the spirit of reconciliation and praised, this, uh, praised it as a, quote, generous impulse and the same realization of unity that you and we together mean to perpetuate and extend in a world dedicated to the welfare of the people of an ordered society in which all men have a fair share. Over a year before the before Operation Overlord, the D-Day, um, British civilians and U.S. military and government officials were then welcomed. Uh, then welcomed this rather forceful reframing of a fierce battle between their two countries' navies. Now, as a gesture of reconciliation and alliance to create a new world after the conflict. 
Now, on this occasion, the translocal region that several actors specified was not between Scotland and the United States. Quote, the women of Yorkshire put only 12 stars in Jones's replica flag because re they recalled that when the original Our American banner was created, its makers, quote, the women of New Hampshire did the same, just 12, uh, 12 stars, in the same for being unsure whether the colony of Georgia had already joined the new United States. U.S. Ambassador Wynant took occasion to express his pride that Yorkshire's ladies remembered the women of his own state, New Hampshire. Thus, the symbolism of this translocal performance of transatlantic relations through memory was not only gendered in its object, but also in some of the people we referred to. Yet for the Scotsman newspaper, it was important to note that Jones was born in Dumfrieshire, not in Yorkshire. Likely the paper wanted to subtly claim Jones for Scotland and therefore also inserting its, in its own nation uh, or specifically the region of Dumfries and Galloway in the imaginaries of this event of transatlantic memory diplomacy. It's possible, but only but so far only mere speculation that the news of a 1943 flag gifting ceremony prompted some of the local leaders of Dumfriesshire to be looking for opportunities to make their own gestures in memory diplomacy across the Atlantic. Now, it may have also made them worry that the Yorkshire coast of England um, may claim Jones through their famous battle and may establish themselves as the translocal site for his memory on this side of the Atlantic, leaving Dumfriesshire out in the cold. They had to wait until the closing of the war, but then they were involved in high profile events around Jones for several years, almost annually. Just over two months after the Allied victory in Europe in July of, uh, July, on July 15, 1945, the US Navy gifted the Church of Kirk Bean a baptismal font. The object was handed over with a ceremony on that Sunday in the Kirk of a village of the church where Jones is said to have been christened after, after his birth nearly two centuries before. Here, U.S. Navy, Navy Chaplain uh, A.S. Chandler reminded the audience that the sailors of the two countries were now fighting side by side in the Pacific and asserted that, quote, Jones was a great man, like a worthy statesman, Mr. Churchill, who said, we shall never surrender. Jones replied uh, to once when uh, ordered to give, uh, to give in on one occasion, he replied, what surrender? We have not had time to fight. Uh, that spirit is the spirit alive today. Here Chandler decontextualized and appropriated uh, Jones's famous quip from his battle with the English at, English at Flamborough and presented, as, presented it as being in the same spirit as Prime Minister Churchill's um, dogged determination to win the current war coming to fruition in just those months. Again, a national government officially, acrobatically, in my view, untangled the United States and Britain from their own internecine warfare 200 years before and rebound them now in an alliance in the current conflict. Importantly, the US chaplain also stressed that, quote, John Paul Jones could never have been the great man he was not but for his background, the teaching in that church and the example round about him. A savvy speaker and cultural diplomat, Chandler found it important to pay tribute to both locality and religious faith on this occasion. But perhaps this was also a clear expectation of the Scottish local leaders. For his own side, you know, the Church of Scotland minister, the Reverend uh, Archibald Main of Kirkbean, accepted the font. And according to the Scotsman newspaper, quote, without entering into the controversy with regard to Paul Jones, he would unhesitatingly declare that he was a very great man. Clearly, there had been some dissenting voices from the officially articulated image of Jones, whether that was about his, uh, who was the, the uh, founder, the father of the American Navy. Perhaps someone maybe in other ways had raised objections about honoring a man who, according to the paper, in April 1778, visiting the British coast in a brig of 18 guns, performed some daring exploits amongst which was a hostile descent on the shores of his native Solway Firth. The christening basin then is an elaborated, elaborately decorated memorial object made by London-based sculptor George Poland. Um, on its meter high pedestal stands a hexagonal basin 
made of Portland stone. It's sides featuring some bronze relief, uh, reliefs of the US <clears throat> Navy heraldry. Jones's famous ship is there and more modern craft and inscriptions of, I quote, dedication to the memory of Jones by the officers and men of the United States Navy who served in Great Britain under the command of Admiral Harold R. Stark. Since this gesture was done by the United States military, there is uh, little likelihood of there being a link to the Office of War Information, so I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to categorize this as propaganda. It was clearly something that would have served to boost morale on both sides. Rather, I think that with this font, the US Navy tried to establish in, in Jones's birth region, a shrine to the man, um, and a little, um, little like their, their, their one in uh, Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, the academy. Uh, for me, it is also rather touching that the uh, the U.S. Navy gave a baptismal fountain um, to the church in Kirk Bean, beyond the rather obvious analogy of uh, Jones's birth and baptism into Christianity there. It is for me poignant that this gift of transatlantic memorial diplomacy reminded people of the value of life being born just at the time when they had been suffering a of uh, loss of life um, so much uh, among many of their fellow citizens in the war that they had just concluded. It is not surprising that not one and a half years later, a hymnal book used at this baptismal font ceremony dedication ceremony was presented by two burghers of Edinburgh to the US Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland, the other side of the ocean. The Scots collected into this hymnary book inscriptions by US General Dwight Eisenhower the Dean of the Thistle and Chapel Royale, the parish's own Reverend Maine, the wife of the Provost of Edinburgh, and even a great, great grand nephew of Jones. This time, a token of the renewed memory politics of Jones was to make the transatlantic journey from a site of Scottish religious faith to one of the ultimate shrines of American civic and military religion, Jones's tomb in Maryland. The early Cold War then saw changes in US-UK relations and, the gener and generated another wave of the use of uh, John Paul Jones for memory diplomacy between the two countries. This wave had similarities with the previous ones, but also differences. The United States was rightly triumphalist about its military might, including the Navy, which had played a role in the allied victory of both the European and the Pacific fronts. The United States was also working out its new place in the world and role in the world. On the other side, Britain and its Navy were in sore need, not only of rebuilding and regenerating, but also of regaining the dignity and pride of so long and recently still ruling over a global empire. The recent experience of a world war that had threatened the very survival of Britain and the security of the United States had also bound them together to some extent a greater extent, perhaps reinforcing the trope of the special relationship in this transitional but profoundly important period. Moreover, competition with, quote, America was now rather impossible for the Brits, unlike in the early century. Um, the use of uh, Jones for transatlantic memory diplomacy began to be institutionalized when in May of 1947, the U.S. Congress established John Paul Jones Bicentennial Commission to orchestrate comm commemorations and anniversary celebrations within the U.S. and likely beyond its borders, including in Anglo-American relations. According to House Resolution 144, the commission was headed by the President of the United States, Leader of the Senate, Speaker of the House, consisted of 12 other members to be provided by them. The commission was in charge of commemorative activities, but it was left to raise funds for these on their own, as well as raise funds for its own staff, for many sources it could, as well as to then also submit a report to Congress after its activities had concluded. Now, subsequently, President Truman declared July 6th, 1947, John Paul Jones Bicentennial Day to remember, quote, the birth of John Paul Jones at Arbiglin in the parish of Kirk B in Kirkcudbury, Scotland. It is noteworthy that in directing all Americans to commemorate Jones, a U.S. patriot decorated for being a leader of a young country's uh, best naval traditions, the U.S. president identified Jones's birthplace, not as Britain or the United, United Kingdom, but as Scotland. Likely, his speechwriter did not want to remind the U.S. public that their quintessentially American naval hero came from the enemy during the revolution. Likely, this was also a gesture that aimed to take Britain, a recently profoundly important ally in the war, out of the picture to avoid controversy. 
especially since the president's proclamation was made on July the 2nd, and the day that Truman designated for Jones was July the 6th. So these, these were on two either side of the American Independence Day, which featured Britain as the bogeyman. Jones's memorial diplomacy must have been planned well before the commission was created and the presidential proclamation made because merely two months later, on July 10th through 13th, 1947, an official U.S. delegation of Navy officers and diplomats participated in Scotland in four days of celebrations with local, regional, and national officials. The visit was memorialized by a brochure in a brochure by the John Paul Jones Bicentennial Committee of Kirkwood Breed Dumfriesshire. This is a local regional um, uh, publication. Uh, according to the Reverend Jason Fisher's forward, quote, this illustrated brochure had been produced under crippling post-war restrictions, but it is nevertheless an earnest token of the committee's desire that the friendships created on that memorable occasion of visit should be cemented. It is clear then that forming and cultivating good relations with the US Navy and government were an imperative for the local leaders but they may have had uh, more material motives on their minds as well. In the same introduction, um, Fisher wrote, and I just look at the, um, the underlying parts, that is why we attach so much importance to the Kirk booth of Kirk in Kirkwood, Kirkwoodbury, the focal point of the celebrations. And it is my sincere wish that the government now, the movement now on foot to preserve this centuries old building as a memorial to John Paul Jones may be carried to fruition. Great hopes are encouraged by the correspondence with which had passed between the John Paul Jones um, Bicentenary Committee and the American Naval Authorities that this will be accomplished by joint endeavor. So despite the devastation um, and scarcity in the aftermath of the war, according to records, the settlement was actually bombed, uh, Kirkwoodbury uh, was actually bombed in uh, May of 1941. The local leaders of the town considered not any rebuilding projects, but the preservation of a historic building as the most important hope from the visit. Jones had been imprisoned in the town's toll booth kind of jail at that point in 1770 on the charge of causing a sailor's death after having him flogged. So however gruesome, the local leaders claimed this episode as a site of memory worth preserving for both the US Navy and this town or region of Scotland. Now, according to the itinerary um, uh, given in the brochure on their three day tour of the region, the group of 12 sailors and three officers um, of the US Navy uh, did a great number of things. Uh, as a rule, uh, the group met each of the seven towns, seven towns within the region. Uh, they're the seven towns leaders, like the provost, the Church of Scotland minister, often the magistrates and the councillors. The brochure only names men in these groups. It shows the gendering of this visit, as well as the roles in such, mem such memorial diplomacy that almost all the names, uh, although almost all the named Jones descendants, uh, who the group met. So there's special occasions where they met people who descended from Jones. But almost all of these people were named were women but also women were the people identified as facilitating refreshments and entertainment, including local officials' wives. So at a time when recently during the war, right, um, where recently during the war, um, uh, the um, women had taken a more prominent role in the, in the labor market and local affairs, the Bicentennial uh, Memorial Brochure 17 uh, photos of the visit are uh, only to feature women uh, in any significant numbers. One is the parade in Kirkwood Brig. So the visit was punctuated not only by the various gatherings at, at important sites of memory, but also by the viewing and gifting of a number of original relics and memorial objects. Like the baptismal font and the hymn book the, in the previous two years, most of these objects were being almost like sent from a memory site of Joneses on one side of the, the Atlantic to the other. Among others, a gold medallion that was uh, specifically created to commemorate the bicentennial of Jones's birth and was gifted by US Navy Commander Russell Macaulay Burke to Provost J uh, Jake Kennedy of Kirkwoodbury. Uh, 
was one of only three of its kind of medallion to others were given to, uh, had been given to President Truman and Admiral James Holloway, then director of the US Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. Commander Burke also presented Kirk Bean's um, Reverend Arthur, Arthur Dixon with a reproduction of the Jones portrait that hung in the Memorial Hall at the Naval Academy, you know, Baltimore, Maryland. So clearly the gifting of memorial objects served uh, to further cement um, cultural diplomatic relations between the institutions and levels of government in the United States and this region of Scotland in the United Kingdom. This also fits Ate's scholarly concept of the sacralization of the past which on um, uh, the US side inter intersected with a highly ritualized civic religion practiced by the military, and we know that. Um, while still uh, calling on tropes about the English speaking peoples, this is likely a holdover from two decades before, some of the Scottish hosts uh, interpreted Jones's memory in the current transatlantic relations in more forceful ways. Uh, the July 11, 1947 issue of the Scotsman not only heavily emphasized the Scottish lineage of many of its many of the sailors in the group, but went on to quote Dumfries Provost uh, Ernest Fife's welcome speech to the U.S. Navy delegation. Quote, and this is sort of um, in, towards the bottom, uh, the underlined. The whole civilized world had cause to be grateful to the Galloway lad John Paul who gave the US Navy such a wonderful tradition. If the US Navy had not cherished the spirit of John Paul Jones, liberty might well have perished from the earth. Here, five breezed, quest breezed past questions of Jones's birth and original citizenship, and primarily he identified the man with this region. He cast Jones as the person who bequeathed the, spirit, the very spirit which made the U.S. Navy the very savior of the freedom of freedom in the world, the victor in the Second World War. The provost thus used Jones's figure to link his region of Scotland and Britain to the institution of the United States Navy, a wartime national ally, a post-war potential partner in economic development, employment, and tourism. Having staked out the, the sites of the memory of John Paul Jones in 1947, the transatlantic commemorative activities in Dumfries and Galloway continued six years later. In 1953, a plaque was unveiled at Jones's birthplace in Scotland by the U.S. Navy and the Daughters of the American Revolution. So check out the um, new organizations, new old organizations coming in. While most British newspaper accounts to the, uh, of this confine themselves to, re to reporting on the event and the ceremony, the July 28th, uh, 1953 issue of the Dundee Courier and Advertisers actually widened its focus. According to the paper, fleets of ships of three nations' navies had arrived in the bases in the River Forth near Edinburgh. A training squadron under the uh, French flag, the British aircraft carrier HMS Glory, and third, a, a training squadron of the U.S. Navy headed by the battleship USS Iowa. Shout out to people from there. I uh, lived there for eight years, uh, earning my PhD. Both the Glory and the Iowa had been deployed in the Korean War, which had just entered the a truce the previous day. The paper reported on the ceremonial welcomes and commemorations conducted by the ship's officers in Edinburgh, and that 300 uh, sailors from the Iowa headed down to London for shore leave. They must have been um, excited about this. And then uh, the paper segued into a discussion of the plaque, plaque unve unveiling ceremony at the cottage of the Arbiglin estate. This way, the unnamed journalist placed this event in the larger geopolitical context of Scotland as a strategic base to refit, resupply, rest, and recuperate of at least three Cold War allied NATO navies. The paper's use of the term, quote, training squadron clarifies the potential ambiguity of accounts of earlier U.S. Navy visits to, to Galloway by uh, Scottish and, and English and uh, British newspapers, uh, which had at times referred to the visitors as cadets or midshipmen. It is clear that either originally or over time, the U.S. Navy used these visits with their uh, people to, um, to um, the memorial sites of Jones for external goodwill, I would also call it civilian relations, and cultural diplomacy, but also for their own uh, US Navy training, likely as field trips. 
we are, um, there's plenty more um, room for research here. We're trying to uh, maybe partner with some uh, Navy historians uh, as well as um, really visit their archives and, and uh, look at that. It shows the it shows the importance of both the U.S. Navy activities in Scotland and of this specific event that the unveiling of the new plaque was attended not only by the twenty cadets and their officers but also by Commander in Chief of U.S. Naval Forces in the Eastern Atlantic and the Mediterranean, Vice Admiral Gerald Wright, British Minister of State for Scotland, Alec Douglas Home, and the current U.S. Ambassador of the United to the United Kingdom, Win, uh, uh, Winthrop Aldrich. Winthrop Aldrich had served in the U.S. Navy uh, in World War I and was also a member of the Pilgrim Society, about which um, um, Stephen had, uh, has written a whole book on their public diplomacy in the first half of the 20th century. So this suggests his record, Aldrich's record of previous serious involvement in U.S.-U.K. public diplomacy. Now, as the U.S. Navy cadet stood an honor guard and the uh, king's own Scottish borderers played ceremonial tunes on their pipes, according to the Yorkshire Post and Leeds Mercury, U.S. Ambassador Aldrich asserted that time has healed old wounds and made possible a dispassionate appraisal of a man, Jones, whose fault of vanity was supremely outweighed by his virtues of courage, faith in himself, daring, and resourcefulness. The Sphere newspaper reported that after the unveiling, Aldrich also pointed out that Jones took his British naval experience to his service in the U.S., in the new U.S. Navy. As his U.S. Navy representative predecessors, this American ambassador was clearly trying carefully to claim some aspect of this past war between the two countries that could be now woven into an alliance some two centuries later, the Cold War Alliance. A list of the entities involved in the unveiling celebration is telling about the institutionalization. By now, it's not just sub-government uh, actors, it's also government actors, it's the Navy, it's now becoming institutionalized, Jones's memory politics and US-UK transatlantic relations. These, uh, ent these entities included representatives of high government, but also now featured both countries' navies, according to newspaper reports. Assist the, they're assisted in the unveiling one sub-Lieutenant Luden Richardson of the Royal Navy um, uh, Volunteer Reserve Dumfries Sea Cadets. The plaque, the plaque for Jones at his birthplace, had been then funded also by the U.S. Naval, uh, U.S. Navy's Naval Historical Foundation, a nonprofit organization established back in 1926 for preserving and promoting to, uh, to the public the U.S. Navy's history and heritage. Its partner in donation for the plaque was the Washington, D.C. Army and Navy chapter, now State Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution, DAR. It's a powerhouse U.S. conservative nonprofit organization with strict geological uh, membership, ge genealogical membership, committed to the preservation and promotion of patriotism in memorialization and education. The DARS programs included commissioning and installing memorials to the graves and other sites of participants in the American Revolution. In keeping with that practice, their plaque on the side of the, of the cottage in Galloway commemorated, quote, Commodore John Paul Jones, illustrious naval hero of the American Revolution. Thus, not only did the Scottish and British proponents of the memory of John, John Paul Jones manage to attract several branches of the U.S. government, but they also managed to broaden the U.S. constituency of Jones's memory in transatlantic relations to a major social group with clout and privilege. I'm going to close this with a final this final episode for me. Uh, the culminating event of the early Cold War, and some of you may have uh, seen this in reruns originally, um, was the use of you, um, the culminating event of this wave, early Cold War wave, the uses of Jones's memory in U.S. Scottish um, U.K. relations, was the film John Paul Jones, directed by John Farrow and starring Robert Stack uh, and uh, Marissa Pavin released by Warner Brothers in 1959. The movie joined the mid-1950s, if you recall from reruns, mid-1950s revival of patriotic US memory and pop popular culture with figures, um, admired figures such as Davy Crockett, the Disney, Walt Disney television uh, um, uh, show and films, and of course the famous ballad, so you probably recall that. This film, the John Paul Jones film, had a surprisingly long and difficult birth. Various versions of it had been in uh, optioning or under production since the 1930s. 
The movie brief, briefly also became the subject of national political controversy about US foreign policy, when in September of 1941, this is war, a wartime, but not, not yet US entry, in the United States Senate subcommittee hearing on quote, propaganda in motion pictures, when isolation and then isolationist U.S. journalist John Flynn and Idaho Senator D. Worth Clark both alleged charged that the reason why a Jones movie was not being released was that Hollywood or government were trying to censor a movie that would show an American naval commander beating the British at sea. So these people were trying to use Jones's memory in popular culture to show that the U.S. government and or the American movie industry were trying to manipulate the US public through popular culture into an alliance with the British and Western European nations at war with Germany. The movie, this movie, 1959, John Paul Jones can be interpreted as not only entertainment venture, but also as US public diplomacy. I choose to interpret it that. It is framed almost as US public diplomacy or civilian relations Navy style. It begins and ends with footage of an actual, on, on an actual US Navy ship where a ranking officer is telling the sailors or the officers, I mean, they are in, that I can, uh, I can see dress whites, um, that they are, quote, you are now an ambassador of goodwill, a role that he claims was pioneered by John Paul Jones. Both the opening credits and the film's media pr promotion also emphasize the assistance and heavy involvement of the US Navy in the production, including personal advice from Fleet Admiral Chester M. Nimitz and being on the technical crew by Rear Admiral J.L. Pratt. Now, scholars have mapped out the many ways in which the United States uh, government, especially its State Department in the early Cold War, had to try and manage the image of race relations, it's, these are the desegregation crises, if you remember, uh, in the United States uh, in the 50s and on, onwards. The film's Jones, 1959, only once, so he, the story, in the story, old Jones only once took a voyage on a slaver, and uh, but as a result, he just so didn't like it, he resolved they would never see a human being bought or sold. Right? Later, John Paul Jones, in effect, inherits from his deceased brother, in Virginia, two enslaved black boys. He names them CPO and Cato, very um, accurately historical revolutionary na um, names of black people. Um, so <clears throat> he he in he decides to honor his brother's plans of liberating them eventually, once they reach the age of maturity. So Jones, in effect, in my interpretation, takes a progressive, liberal, white, paternalistic um, role that conflates his guardianship of, of, of uh, the two Black boys uh, in their minority with their status as enslaved. They would be manumitted uh, on reaching adulthood, it is suggested. Thus, the movie advocates a moderately progressive, liberal um, gradualism, both about abolition, right? and by implication about civil rights and the previous decades burning issue of desegregation, which it, the, it kind of confirms almost as if it confirms the Supreme Court words, you have to desegregate with all deliberate, deliberate speed, right? So <clears throat> instead of the, so uh, in the movie after then being liberated, so the, the two young boys are, are liberated as, uh, as they're uh, reaching into, into um, adulthood or young adulthood, um, both Cato and Scipio then, after being liberated, still serve with Jones in the battles of the revolution on sea, and one of them loses, their, loses his life. So in effect, this one boy becomes equal um, with his white fellow Americans in making the ultimate sacrifice for the national project. Now, in most other early Cold War US-UK uh, memory diplomacy, Jones's service in Russia does not make an appearance. The 1959 Warner Brothers film devotes almost 10 minutes to scenes where the US Congress offers a secondment to Jones as real admiral in Russia. He accepts it, he goes to meet the Empress Catherine in Russia. The, uh, Catherine first tests him with fineries and finds him committed to his mission. Then the Empress briefs him, and uh, then there's a montage of Jones's heroic work against much adversity and his victories against the Turks in the Black Sea with the Russian Navy. 
This is much of today's battleground, by the way. Um, so it is very possible that the film dared to treat the hero's advancement of Russian imperial projects precisely because of its timing, 1959, 1958, as it's, they are producing it. In an unprecedented gesture of thaw and goodwill, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev and his wife visited the United States in September 1959, just three months to the day after the, after the, the film's release. With some improvement in US-Soviet relations in the air, the, the movie could dare to depict a reasonably friendly version of Jones' service of the Russian, um, uh, of the Russian Tsarina against the Turks. Now in our presentation, we have tried to examine uh, from the 1890 through maybe 1960 or so, um, the early Cold War uh, activities in the transatlantic memory diplomacy of John Paul Jones through a focus on the region of his birth and later um, raids to Britain, the region of Dumfries and Galloway, as well as um, uh, a variety of regions uh, and, and kind of translocal connections in the United States. It is clear from our preliminary research that uh, um, the, the, these, these were important sites uh, and important um, constructions of Jones as Southern US, uh, US, um, British, um, transatlantic figure um, and, and builder of bridges, interestingly enough. Um, uh, and that uh, the leaders of Dumfriesshire used the memory of Jones uh, to build strong relations with the US Navy, likely in hopes of continued, pr continued presence, donations, investment, possibly even tourism. For their own part, the US Navy, I'm speculating, clearly used these sites of Jones's memory over time, focusing on his birthplace for purposes of its own training and education, and likely also as a conscious effort at cultural diplomacy with Scotland and the United Kingdom, possibly as a residue of also wartime civilian relations. The local leaders in Scotland usually tied Jones's figure to a love of liberty that either transcended national belonging or found a home in the, in the cause of the United States, young United States, along with the US Navy, uh, took pains, they took pains to downplay the lethal conflict of Jones's time between America and Britain and rather use the great man to symbolically rebind the two countries into the alliance, the alliance that was so crucial to British survival during World War II and was fast developing into a robust political, global political and military coalition against communism. The heating up of the, of the Cold War uh, subsequently uh, preempted most official articulations of the meaning of Jones's late, late 18th century service in Russia. Thank you very much. Right. And we're finished. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, George. We'd, we'd now like to open the floor to a uh, question, answer, discussion, comments, please, everyone. Jack, if you'll please unmute microphones and turn the cameras back on. Johnson's gonna just make a quick global comment. Yes, um, please. Th thank you so I much for this very, very interesting um, <clears throat> Um, very interesting presentation, but just, just on pronunciation, um, American English tends to uh, emphasize the first syllable of words, whereas the Scots emphasize most normally the second syllable. So we've got our Bigland. I, I'm brought up in Dumfries. I was born in Dumfries. Uh, Dumfries, uh, Kirkbean, you know, second syllable for the Scots. Um, you did um, Kirkubri pretty well, but there's also a Dundee, you know, so I just... Uh, if you if in doubt, um, don't emphasize the first syllable. Also, a, a quick thing on the day is um, attack on uh, the Solway Firth. Um, I, I believe it was Workington, and his men had been at sea for so long. When they came ashore, they just found the first pub, and so very little damage was done. They all got drunk, in other words. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, guys. I thought that was really, really good. Very thorough. And it's amazing to me how, you know, you're brought up with a certain kind of way that they say it, and then you hear it later on, uh, you know, about how you guys presented it. And it's more, such more of a realistic uh, human side of it, you know, uh, instead of, because I remember that movie when it came out, I thought that was that was cool. You know, kids around the neighborhood were playing John Paul Jones, you know, mm -hmm. you know, emulating him. So, you know, I thought that was exceptional the way that you guys put it. And thanks so much for coming out today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, I try to get the 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 pronunciation right. Um, my partner tells me that when I try to do um, Scottish Scottish dialect, I, I shouldn't because I it's just cringy. So uh, I I do uh, apologize to to anybody who um, I I, did, I didn't get didn't quite get that right. The, the stresses. I thought you're fine, George. I thought you're fine. I'll just right. have him. I'll just have him say the say the say the word, please. <laughs> So I, I have one one comment. It's uh, a tradition in the Clan MacLeod that uh, the Dunvegan Castle and Sky has only been attacked one time, and that supposedly was with John Paul Jones came into Loch Dunvegan and fired a cannon at the castle. It just so happens there was a funeral going on, and... John Paul Jones thought it was a war party and turned around and went back out to sea. So I I don't know. I've heard that uh, comment many, many times. So I'm assuming it's correct, but he did pillage along the Scottish coast mm -hmm. uh, during the Revolutionary War. I'm, So I'm I'm assuming it's correct. I've even heard it from the uh, Clan McLeod chief. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't very successful at pillage, pillaging Scottish coast. He didn't quite make it. Yeah. Usually, he tried to attack Leith, but then get, the, the wind blew him back up the fourth. <laughs> yeah. Well, the good news is the cannon missed the castle, <laughs> so we never did get hit. <clears throat> This is why it's it's fascinating to me that, that he did these things um, um, as as well, the, the little facts that we know about him, and yet his in his memory has really been used in so many ways of basic paper these over, uh, re explain explain around these things of why he really was such an important bridge builder between the Brits and the, the Americans. I don't know. Danielle, do you want to? I do. I actually have a question. Good morning. I'm Danielle Dahl Benedetto. I'm currently studying at the Naval Postgraduate School. And I had a question actually about uh, one of John Paul Jones Jones's most famous quotes that have not yet begun to fight. Um, there is some research, and I'm not sure if it's conjecture or not, but um, there's some research that says that he may not have been the one to say it. That it may have been said by, I believe, his second mate, but please forgive me if I've remembered that erroneously. In your studies, have you encountered anything that would either support or um, detract from that that uh, claim? Yeah, this, yeah, I think that's a feature of much of what people think John said. And so the, the statue that I put on the slide at the start, the statue is in Washington D.C. The, the statue of Jones in Washington D.C. It's just off the mall, and I was I was using the um the records of the committee that was set up to build the statue in 1912, and they had a big correspondence about did he say this that that particular quotation, alongside other other quotations too. That isn't on the statue, um, because they couldn't persuade themselves that he did say it. So yeah, that that yeah, there's a, I think that's likely he probably didn't say it. Um, and it's certainly been asked before. It, the, the statute commission they ended up they ended up uh, writing to the the Library of Congress asking for for clarification about that point as well. Um, and the historian came back and said, "No, probably not." So, 
Beyond that, um, I can't say much more, but from that particular instance, uh, it seems that he didn't say it and folk have asked that question already and found it to be a bit of a creative license, which I think is a feature of Jonesy's life, isn't it? Yeah, of, of almost any memory. Um, yeah, I, I, I actually admire them that they did due diligence yeah, to try yeah, to yeah. get, try to really ascertain mm -hmm. about that. That's great. So, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it's, it's, uh, it shows something about the potency or the or the um, the inspirational sort of myth that is built around um, Jones. That that stuff comes up again and again and again, and it's almost in just about any context. I don't know if it was a miners or the Labour Party in the 1980s that you sometimes see things like the way ha I we we haven't even begun to fight, and it's kind of absolutely decontextualized from the original and recontextualized and used for uh, uh, different agendas. But I think that's that's why myths are so powerful, and that's why we, it's 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 an amazing thing to to study these things. I know I've randomly used it, so uh, it's a great <laughs> quote, absolutely fantastic. Um, and then I also have kind of like a follow-up question about the myth, you know, you brought up the, the myth behind the man and you touched on this a lot during your presentation about like the history and how um, there were negative things in his past, but then he kind of turned over a new leaf and became this revolutionary. And then in your studies, have you seen, I mean, there are always a lot of claims. He said, she said, you know, about people's past and histories. And, um, you know, sometimes people lie, sometimes there's truthful evidence. Um, have you seen any sort of solid evidence to support like the the negative aspects of his life? Um, and do you think that um, that his his memory has kind of been boosted in order to create kind of a an American hero? Um, I know that's kind of a guided question. I apologize for that, <laughs> but without getting more words, yes. <laughs> um, I, I guess I'm looking for proof and evidence. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I suppose the most negative thing that he's accused of doing, of course, is, is a, a, a raping young girl in, in Russia, in St. Petersburg, when he was there, which I don't believe, I, I believe the consensus said that was a, that was made up by political opponents. Um, so I think that particular allegation, perhaps we can, we can deal with in that sense. The other stuff about his kind of disciplinary, his disciplinarity is sort of uh, the way that he, he was, he, he ran a, a hard ship. Um, he did punish people severely um, who stepped over the line. I believe that's all true, certainly. And how how different he was to anybody else, I, I don't I don't know. Um, but there was the accusation that he did uh, kill um, a mutineer, and that's of course why he ended up changing his name. He was trying to flee justice, um, and he took the name John Paul Jones rather than just as uh, John Paul. So. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but certainly his life is uh, complicated and not easily translatable to the present day, which I suppose uh, is not unique to uh, a variety of different historical heroes. And talking about translatable to the present day, I think that some people today, if the Scottish government decided or uh, to start using um, John Paul Jones as uh, one of the icons, um, of, I don't know, Scottish history, because there are some pantheons of icons of Scottish history. I think some folks would probably try to dig um, because they, they might not like the idea that somebody who had run slaver voyages and, um, you know, th those those kinds of things or someone who was, was arguably a pirate or a sellsword or somebody who was, uh, was arguably a traitor to his own country would be getting this kind of pantheonic, um, you know, um, adoration or, or um, li being lifted on a pedestal. So, um that that I think is what is fascinating to me is what is forgotten, what is selected out or in for for certain people's agendas, certain groups' agendas of um, using using uh, uh, Jones's memory for um, for for doing those things. And I think that you know we we're playing with the idea of, of uh, writing up uh, the last chapter of a book on why Jones is or is not a, a longer a, a usable past, um, the usable icon for. I don't know, Scotland, the United States, regionally. He's still very much used in the United States Navy today as a, as a hero. So I just wanted to point that one out. <laughs> Everybody knows about him. So. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, his crypt is like the main attraction at the Naval Academy. Um, so I mean, it's horrible. It's a horrible big... <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, <laughs> I it's a hideous uh, sarcophagus and all that. Anyway, that's not my no. subjective opinion. So. It's okay, that's you. Yeah. Professors, I, I guess just to reiterate what uh, Ms. Dow was was getting to, because I'm curious, uh, all I've heard uh, in support of the negative feedback associated with John Paul Jones is that he was accused of something he didn't do, the rape, and that he punished uh, wrongdoers severely on his ships he did, uh, I suppose he was captain of slave ships, which is not good, although slavery was very much accepted during that age. As a matter of fact, I think uh, second president John Adams was probably the only founding father who did not own slaves at the time. But I'm just curious, am I understanding standing you correctly or what are you... What is what are the charges against John Paul Jones, please? Well, as far as I understand, again, this is not we're not talking about his life and times. We're talking about his memory. So I'm talking about only the things that that uh, that come up could come up in his memory. The way he's um, some of the things that are presented in various you know museum exhibitions, um, leaflets, brochures, those kinds of things. That he did you know, have several uh, slaving voyages, um, and then there's this allegation of uh, raping a young, young woman um, that uh, and cruelty on the high seas. And this is these are some of the that's and then from the you know if you want to have a, a very much a nationalistic British point of view, he's he is a traitor to his own country. From if you wanted to think about this as you know seriously of okay, well, there's a Scottish boy. From you know the southwest, and he basically goes over to the uh, to the uh, to uh, to the colonies, and then brings a fleet of ships and raids his own his own coastline. I mean, I just I think that some of these are not as can can not as be as easily dismissed. But what we're dealing with is sort of the way that these things are or are not used in memory, as opposed to I'm not going to go and try to verify any of these because that's not what I study. Uh, and I, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't presume to do that. Um, there's revolutionary historians who are able to do that, and they can they can if you if you want to. That's not my agenda. Um, so I'm I'm almost as if it's it's basically I'm looking at a figure, but not the person in the life and times. And I I would like to point out that many originally uh, many people who originated in Scotland and England and Ireland and Wales migrated to America, became patriots and supporters of independence and independent America, and therefore changed their loyalties to Britain and mm -hmm. took on loyalties to America, which the, you're also faulting him for. Well, 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 we're, we're not faulting him for anything. We're just suggesting that... Um... Uh, you know, how, how appropriate his reputation is at any given time. I mean, to be honest with you, I, I, I wouldn't make the point that very few historical figures stand up to any kind of scrutiny or are usable in the present day because we must study them uh, on the basis of their own time. We, uh, John Paul Jones, to us, is, is uh, a, t a test case, if you like, for exploring different ideas in the 20th century mm -hmm. in large part. Um, the fact that he was, you know, obviously, uh, you know, he, he joined uh, a revolutionary cause and that in lots of ways is very commendable of course as um i think i think it's the other aspects of his life uh, that are more uh, problematic the issue with him uh, i think i suppose it's an interesting test case too because we are dealing with a figure who is used to try and connect britain and america but who has got very different um uh, reputations well we didn't really touch on this all that much in the presentation but some of the the, the newspaper coverage of jones um in the uk is really negative. He's really regarded as a pirate, <laughs> and, uh, and it's a really sort of a. I don't actually. I'm not saying it's true or right or wrong. Just to, it's interesting that somebody who can be used to connect two countries has such diametrically opposed rep reputations. Mm -hmm. um, some of the stuff you read about Jones in the, the Scottish and the British materials can be really quite vitriolic, vitriolic. Uh, no doubt too much so, but um, uh, they're very. He's very uh, disliked in some quarters.
I'd just like to thank you for the presentation because that was just fascinating. I had no idea how these things were interconnected and, and how they used him. And, and I really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And can I just mention something really quick? I was trying to put my hand up there, Constance. Uh, I just put in the chat the name of a book that was, I just called my a friend in Miami who wrote a chapter on one of the most recent books on John Paul Jones about, called John Paul Jones and the Bonhomme Richard. He wrote the chapter on the actual battle um, we actually sailed on the HMS Rose together, which was a the um, it, it was a reconstruction of the 1750s frigate that's kind of almost contemporary with John Paul Jones. So, it, uh, but anyway, uh, his his name was Peter Reevely, the guy who wrote the the chapter, and he was trying to update me on the fact that uh, the the uh, the fact that Bono, that uh, John Paul Jones said we've not begun to fight only um, only came up 25 years later. He says. You know, it was not a contemporary comment. Very <laughs> uh, possibly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, again, we're, we're not we're not experts of that period, but I do understand. I think an element of John Paul Jones's reputation was also was kind of started by by Thomas Jefferson. I think he was involved in beginning this sort of process of of bigging him up. Um, again, I'm not an expert on that period, but uh, yeah, that, what you say there about that phrase coming up uh, later on uh, makes sense. I think we're just slightly over time. Are there any additional comments or questions for Professors Bowman and Toth today? Okay, well, um, Stephen and George, I just wanna thank you for being with us today. This is a very interesting thesis and um, appreciate you making the time. Uh, Gus, wanna thank you for being here today and Jack, thanks for everything you do. And friends, thank you for, for joining. We'll hope to see you all next month. Without you, the forum wouldn't exist, so please, do continue to support us and uh, come come next month to hear Marjorie Harper. Thank you. Thank you, professors. Thank you, thank you for having us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, professors. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Be safe, you, everyone. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm.